Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Thursday, March 7, 2019, and I want to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Please do hit the like button, guys, and if you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe. I leave a link at the end of the video and uh, other related stuff at the end of the video so please do check that out as well okay guys well i have a very interesting um article to actually read for you today it's by a guy named cliff dunning and you might have heard of him before he's the uh, host of a popular podcast called earth ancients you might have seen the videos on youtube but um cliff's done a, a very interesting article on um, El Carasal or El Caracal at Chichen Itza and um, you know I'm sure you're familiar with it you've seen it many many times you know even on the History Channel it's just a you know well-known monument Mayan monument that everybody's familiar with um, but Cliff took a little bit deeper look into it and he has some interesting proposals he consulted an engineer who's also um, a student of Mayan uh, archaeology and architecture and um, they came up with an interesting proposal and um, I could I could see where they're coming with this but you know look it's just a theory but it's a very interesting one because you have to ask yourself some questions about this observatory you know, they're clearly looking at the sun and the heavens and this, you know, obsession with it and the keeping of the time and the calendar and corrections and all this kind of stuff that they were busy doing, you know, based on their astronomy. And Venus also plays heavily into this. And there's something about Venus that, you know, people should really consider because, you know, it a lot of the Mayan astronomy had to do with the sun and the moon and an obsession with the planet Venus. And you have to ask yourself why. You know, why would they be so obsessed with the planet Venus? And, you know, there's all kinds of theories and speculations and everything about it, but we'll talk a little bit about that later but um let me get to the article for you because it's very interesting and you know he takes a nice look at this some very interesting pictures um that he took i guess while he was there you get inside this thing and by the way el carasal or el caracal means the snail and the reason why they say it's a snail is because of the spiral staircase that goes up inside it but you know, you can also sort of see that from above, too, slightly, because it's open somewhat. But, um, you know, because it had the spiral staircase, the native peoples there called it the snail. Okay, so let's get to the article here. I'll read it to you. All right. Advanced engineering discovered at the Mayan Observatory at Chichen Itza. In 1526, the Spanish conquistador Francisco de Montejo arrived at the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and found most of the great Maya cities deeply eroded and unoccupied, which is interesting in itself because being so eroded and everything just, you know, says, you know, so much about it. I mean, some stone monuments can just sit and sit and sit, even with the jungle encroaching upon it, and, you know, never really anything happens to it, but, you know, in this case, it could have been the plant life that, you know, destroyed some of it, but it's hard to say, so leave that open. Many generations removed because, the reason why I'm saying is because you have so many other sites around the Americas that seem like they were like, you know, destroyed and blown up by something, not through sort of natural, you know, encroachment of the, you know, tree growth or anything. You know, that's why I'm saying that. So, I mean, we don't know. But this thing had to be rebuilt somewhat. 
many generations removed from the master builders, engineers, and scientists who conceived and built the cities, the remaining Maya they encountered had degenerated into wearing groups who practiced blood rituals and human sacrifice. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the great city of Chichen Itza was reduced to piles of stones with the vestiges of buildings, pyramids, and other structures left in ruin. Okay, so kind of hard to say what left them in ruin exactly, or they're not saying it, or nobody says, or it's all just, you know, the jungle growth or whatever, but I have a feeling that it's not that only. My, the Maya elders who I've spoken to with, with, report that Chichen Itza was a teaching university and that different cultures throughout the Americas had access to a variety of sciences, agricultural studies, and the healing arts for hundreds or thousands of years, which very interesting proposition there by Dunning and, you know, I guess what other people are, you know, starting to believe that you know, these people were far more advanced that we, than we think, but you also have to consider, too, at the same time, that maybe they weren't quite as superstitious as we think as well. You know, they're going to say, you know, well, yeah, but they were superstitious. I don't think so. I don't think you should, could have this high level of... Uh, you know, learning and academics and everything and, you know, be a slave to superstition. I just I find that difficult to believe. Do you? I, I do. All right. So, highly advanced sciences. We know now that the Maya developed a number of highly advanced sciences, highlighted by their spectacular knowledge of astronomy. They were skilled engineers and had mathematics which could calculate dates billions of years in the past and far into the future. It's estimated that when Friar Diego de Landa discovered text in buildings and in use by the surviving people, he burned them and destroyed libraries, technical manuals, and the history of one of the most advanced cultures on our planet, leaving us wondering at the history of the Maya. So, you know, thank you very much, uh, you know, uh, the Jesuits or whoever it was that was... Uh, busy destroying the past under orders from uh, who knows who, some entities or something like that. So here's a picture of El Carasol at Chichen Itza that I guess the author took. And it's very interesting that, you know, Mayan construction techniques, building techniques and architecture has you know, these very sort of specific design elements in it to a number of design elements, a number of building techniques in stone, some with, you know, cut stone and then ir also irregular stone. It's a very interesting combination and you have to ask yourself, you know, they could cut stone with such precision. In some areas, it looks like, you know, maybe people after the Maya were trying to build in these places, but, you know, doing a terrible job of it, you know. All right, so let's go on with this. Highly advanced sciences, okay, we're still reading from that. In 1913, Sylvanus Morley, an American archaeologist working with the Carnegie Institute, received permission by the Mexican government to excavate the main acropolis at Chichen Itza. One of these buildings was the El Carasol which he discovered as an astronomical observatory for charting the heavens, okay? So, let's take a look at the picture of that. Okay, there it is. Before, you know, when it was found with jungle growth on it. And, um, it seems like an awful lot of damage for just, you know, ordinary jungle growth there. And there it is after it was rebuilt and you know there's the freeze on it right there that's still intact some other freezes partial and the viewing ports viewing windows at the top at least the ones that are still left 
All right. As the excavation team began to reassemble the building, they encountered a number of advanced design features which had only been incorporated after significant research and development and understanding in correctly aligning the central observatory with the cosmos. Through careful reconstruction and observation, we made great strides in learning how the Maya used the observatory to chart the movement of specific planets the beginning and conclusion of seasons and other astronomical events. Now, I just have a little bit of a comment with this, and it goes into observing space and time, but I'm just thinking to myself, you know, I mean, I don't, is the freeze on the front of it very interesting. I'm just, I don't know, but, you know, I don't follow the movements of stars in the heavens, but I'm pretty kind of clear on, you know, the seasons and when it's most likely to be rainy and when it's good to plant. And, you know, those things seem like, you know, pretty common. Not, I mean, you didn't have to keep your eyes on the heavens so much for those particular things to happen or whatever. But, you know, to be honest with you, I think that they were keeping their eyes on the heavens for another reason, and they were especially keeping their eyes on Venus. Because you just have so many things uh, related to Venus that seem very suspect, and a fellow that goes through it, is Emmanuel Velikovsky in his Worlds in Collision, okay? Let me just read to you from this, and the reason why I think that they were keeping their eyes on the heavens because they were worried about something. All this other stuff, you know, keeping track and the time, corrections, you know, important stuff, no less, but the main reason why they had to keep their eyes on a thing so carefully or whatever, because things happen in a short period of time, you know, catastrophic things, and, you know, like, look at us. We want, a, like, an asteroid warning system, right? And, you know, I always say, you know, we don't, it's not adequate. These things come out of left field. They can't watch all parts of the sky. You know, all this stuff. So think about it, okay? But let me read to you a little bit if you don't know about Velikovsky and Worlds in Collision. Worlds in Collision, the most discussed book of our time, propounds the startling theory that more than once with historical times, the order in our planetary system was disturbed and caused enormous cataclysms. More than once. The earth became a primeval chaos lashed by tornadoes of cinders. The skies darkened, land masses were destroyed, and large portions of the human race perished. The publication of Worlds in Collision in 1950 shook the scientific world, and the furor has not yet abated. Many of Dr. Velikovsky's assumptions that were regarded as contradicting established views in science have been verified and confirmed by new discoveries. Emmanuel Velikovsky studied natural sciences at the University of Edinburgh, history, law, and medicine, that's all, in his spare time, study those things, but you know, he's crazy, you know, also in, Mo in Moscow, biology in Berlin, the working of the brain in Zurich, and psychoanalysis in Vienna, since 1939, he's lived in the United States, and he's now long past since the 1970s, but they made this guy's life miserable because he came up with a number of proposal based on the mythologies of the world and all these petroglyphs and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, this relates also to the Thunderbolts project. If you don't know anything about it, they continue Velikovsky's work, okay? And this little stick man thing is seen as a toro toroidal, as per Anthony Peratt, the top... Um, you know, um, plasma scientist on the planet, you know, who drew this relationship. And you can even see it in my videos on my channel when I go out to Petroglyph National Monument in Albuquerque, New Mexico here. Um, and I climb up the facade here. This one was dedicated to uh, uh, Clint Steele at the Kronos channel. 
and you can see right here this guy right here is just another representation of the toroidal configuration because of the proximity of the planets in alignment that solar system went crazy and created all these cataclysms more than once and Venus appeared as a great comet according to Velikovsky okay the great comet Venus <coughs> and there's very interesting things about Venus that people should know about okay so it's very interesting to me that the Mayans followed Venus so closely and you have this you know sort of you know observations made by you know Velikovsky the Thunderbolts project you know other people okay here's what the Mayans thought of it Coco Khan which is Venus okay where it's depicted mostly in almost all mythologies around the world as a you know love goddess woman but it had its other aspects in the past too it's its evil aspect okay that nobody seems to talk about with the Venus mythology in uh, Western cultures but here in you know Central America here they have Kugelkan the ancient minds used the doorways and windows of their buildings as astronomical sightings especially for the planet Venus at Uxma all buildings are aligned in the same direction surprisingly minds knew the motions of Venus with much accuracy and you know this obsession with Venus just says to me about you know lends itself to a lot what Velikovsky was talking about Venus the morning star was the patron planet of warfare sort of like the planet Mars which was also in close proximity to the earth many offerings were made to Venus and the Sun we know from a historian that people would stop to, uh, listen to this that people would stop up their chimneys so that no light from Venus could enter their houses and cause harm. Isn't that interesting? About Venus, a little dot in the sky. Okay, so back to this article here. And uh, some pictures for you here. All right, there's the freeze. All right. Observing space and time. The El Carasol Observatory stands at a mass of 75 by 57 meter, 246 by 246 foot platform, engineered to support the tower and counterbalance any movements in the Earth. To date, no surface penetrating radar has been used to detect what lies inside the platform, but it appears that a drainage system was incorporated to keep water from accumulating on the surface. Hmm. The terrace which connects the observatory to the platform measures 26 by 30 meters, 85 by 98 feet, and contains engineering features that function in a surprisingly efficient manner as a viewing mechanism. Two flights of stairs lead to the highly complex cylindrical structure that sits on a round base 18 meters, 59 feet I guess, in diameter which is covered with in a Puick, sty in Puick style freezes with projecting cornices okay and that's the freeze that they're talking about right there all right with the projecting cornices all right that seems so nice and evenly cut you know uh, you know and again with these constructions all the time you have to ask yourself these people have the ability to cut stone right so you know, if you're doing this project and you're running the project, you're the director of the project. You say to yourself, okay, guys, we're going to build this thing, all right, this observatory thing, all right? And we need X amount of stone, all right? So I want you to cut X amount of blocks like this, another X amount of blocks like this, you know, to make cornices and all this kind of stuff. And I want you to just cut a bunch of six-sided blocks, even inside or so whatever but they don't have them even inside so it makes you wonder you know these people are so advanced on so many levels engineering mathematics astronomy you know uh, you know uh, all kinds of you know herbal medicines and, and, and medicine in general you know even down to you know uh, operating on people you trepanating their skulls and all this kind of stuff they had knowledge of surgery and what well, and 
they're not going to build, if they can cut stone, they're not going to make a bunch of, you know, even stones to make it all nice and even just around the cornices and stuff. And, you know, nowhere else. I mean, you have to ask yourself these questions. It doesn't entirely make sense to me. And when you see the blocks that they cut, they're nice six-sided, you know, square, perfect 90-degree angle blocks. But they're like all different sizes. And you have to ask yourself why. They just... You know, for expeditious, you know, to expedite it, you know, is that what they did it, you know, hastily? I don't know, but it just, you have to ask yourself these questions because, all right, now we got to that part, yeah. All right, back to this. Okay, the tower, okay, we read that, right? No, the tower, the main, main viewing area stands 28 meters 92 feet above ground level is surrounded by two massive curved slots. So he's talking about these curved slots, which I always wondered about in the sides of the buildings, less these things. This is what he came up, you know, this is, this are the curved slots. I'm, I'm pointing at the paper. Here's the curved slots, and this is what Dunning imagines with his engineer friend that studied these things was in there. So we'll read about that. <clears throat> okay, so the west-facing slot drops down over 8 meters, 26 feet, into the base of the building, while the eastern-facing slot is only a few feet deep. We'll return to these slots shortly, but it should be noted that each was designed to support a mu movable viewing apparatus that anchored at the base. This is the artist's ren rendering of the mu movable facade provides an idea for how they were positioned within the massive slot. So here's what Dunning came up with his engineer friend, these viewing plates or templates, which I think is that's what they were, templates. But he doesn't say that. I'm saying that. All right. The construction of the Carousel Tower contains a series of interesting technological and architectural innovations culminating in three concentric cylinders separated by ring vaulting. The outer cylinder has four doorways placed at the cardinal point of the compass. A circular corridor, quote-unquote, separates it from the middle cylinder, which measures 8 meters, 26 feet in diameter. The second circle has four doors in a quincunx, five points arranged in a cross, arrangement in relation to those on the exterior. Like the first, it has a vaulted ceiling and contains a solid central core of masonry, which a narrow spiral passage leads to the high chamber with spy holes in the walls. The building was heavily damaged when it was discovered and only three surviving spy holes provide us enough information to understand the function of the observatory. Now look at a spy hole. There's a spy hole for you. One of the spy holes. The Maya astronomical system revealed. The astronomical observation was made by examining the angles traced by light traveling along the tunnel as formed as a long, narrow spy hole. Measurements of the angle between the right-hand edge and the external opening and the left-hand edge of the interior opening allow for extremely precise observations. What we now understand is that the first observation aperture faces directly south. The second aligns with the setting of the moon on March 21st. The third faces directly towards the west and towards the point where the sun sets at the equinoxes on March 21st and September 21st. Coming up, guys, March 21st. Okay. All right, see some more spy holes here. Oh, hold on there. There's a spy hole, so it looks like maybe a repair, a little bit of repair to retain that one. It looks might have been falling apart, so they did this repair in there. But you can see the blocks of stone in there seem very um, precisely cut and flat. Um, again, it, it makes you wonder, I mean, the interior of this thing seems better um, built than the exterior, but... It seems like a combination of things on the outside, like I said. So different building techniques or who knows, maybe the Mayan found this thing. They don't know. There's older civilizations there. Um, you know, a lot of the people, uh, CF apps have been going over some of these places, you know, much, much older than the Mayans in South America there. We don't know the history of the Americas. It's just 
Don't assume that we do. We just do not. All right. Finally, the second viewpoint through the same spy hole corresponds to the setting of the sun at the summer solstice on June 21st. These details are, are the foundations of the Mayan Maya astronomical system, the X and Y upon which the more detailed observations are based. Missing pieces to the puzzle. How, you might ask, were the Maya able to calculate the movements of Venus and other planets, including the sun and the moon? Archaeologists would have us believe that the naked eye was sufficient for these observations and calculations, but I think there is a missing piece to this puzzle. A good deal of the upper section of the observ observatory is damaged and must have contained additional spy holes and other tools for viewing the heavens. Scientists have determined that the sun, moon, and Venus were key factors in Maya astronomical observation and have determined that the spy holes were used to track the movement of the planets. So... This is obsession with the movement of the planets. Um, you know, I don't think we nearly have as much as an obsession today. And again, we try to make these people look very superstitious and ignorant and on one hand and very advanced on the other hand, you know, which is certainly quite possible. But I have a tendency to believe otherwise. If you're this advanced, you know, why do something that, you know, keep your eye on something that really doesn't need you to keep your eye on? You know, do we, I mean, do, I mean, we're cognizant of the changing of the seasons. And again, we know all of these things that we, you know, are we obsessed with looking at the movement of the moon and everything? But I think the reason why is because of what Velikovsky's theory was, you know, when these things start to move, you're, you're in deep crap. So, you know, you better, you know, have a plan B or whatever. And I think that's what all of these people were obsessed with astronomy like it as such because, you know, they were waiting for the next thing to happen and, you know, they wanted to be aware of it, okay? All right, so in any case, let's read on here. <clears throat> The original designs for the observatory appears to have been multifunctional. Okay, let me just uh, wait a second. That was a uh, that was an illustration. Hold on a second. I just read about there. Okay, so that's the illustration showing the different angles going in there for observations. Okay, where it points to south, Venus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You see how it comes through there. Okay, next. All right. The original design for the observatory appears to have been multifunctional and may have, been, it may have included a number of engineering features that allowed for enhanced viewing, which is very interesting. Because the tower was heavily eroded, we'll never know how the complete observatory looked when it was in operation. But there are a number of clues that until now have never been well understood. I wanted to get, to the, get the opinion of an engineer to determine if what I suspected in the design of the terrace was possible. I called Jim Ocon, a forensic engineer and an expert on Maya construction techniques to review my hypothesis and to comment on the function of the strange slots. <coughs> Mechanics and optics for enhanced viewing. And here's the top view of this thing. Here's the slots. It's interesting. While this one has notches and different things over here, this one doesn't. It has maybe other elements in it. Just very curious about those things. Okay, back to this. Mechanics and optics for enhanced viewing. Design in the outer terrace are two slots pits that follow the curvature of the tower and support a viewing mechanism. The west-facing slot is approximately 8 meters, 26 feet deep, and could have housed an articulating facade which moved with the movement of the planets. The smaller eastern slot is about 2.5 meters, 8 feet deep, and had limited range of motion. I've reasoned that the Maya built these slots to support a viewing apparatus or movable facade and fixed optics. This outer structure could be moved up or down depending on the operator which manually positioned at the bottom of each slot. Okay, that's the aerial photo of it. See the slots. Engineering rendering. For, okay, he's gonna, he engineered this thing. Okay, to show it was like a movable platform with this facade on it deep in the pit or whatever. The pit was a, you know, a base for it or whatever and then they would move these things on wooden wheels. Okay, O'Connor's convinced that the Maya developed the wheel, evidence of the numerous toys and covered with wheels. And I believe in the distant past, the addition of mechanics or gears allowed the operators to move vertically and horizontally like an elevator observing the heavens. These new functions of the observatory would allow for day or evening observation. Okay, and here's a rare photo. See if we can get to it here. 
rare photo by Thor Heidel with wheels with gears on it, okay? And, you know, you have to ask yourself questions. Why, 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 why? Let me try to get through this. Uh... A unique engineering feature suggested O'Connor is a track system, which is for the movement of the side and, conf and conform to the slots, interior siding and flooring. The track and base with wheels housed the moving apparatus and was ma manually operated with the interior of the terrace and ex access through the doorway designed into the western wall. We know the Romans used similar lift systems to rise and lower platforms in a massive coliseum in Rome. These elevators were designed to move scenery, scenery gladiators and even wild animals onto the main amphitheater for viewing entertainment. I believe the same type of elevator was used to operate the massive viewing facades within the observatory. The artist rendering shows an approximate position for the facades and how they may have appeared. What we cannot know is what a Additional devices or tools were embedded into each section to observe the heavens. Okay. And here's a western slot with wooden reinforcements. But, you know, wood can be replaced, guys, and needs to be replaced if you're using it in a stone structure. And if you're so advanced, you know that wood is not going to last and it'll eventually you have to be replaced. So keep that in mind. All right. Okay, so I'm getting short here, and it says lenses for celestial movement. So let me just briefly just throw this at you, okay? What he's proposing is that these movable platforms, they knew something about lenses, okay? So these lenses were mounted into these movable platform walls, okay, that he's talking about, all right? In a way to view the planets or, the, you know, the night sky.